Okay, thank you again. You know, I, um, you know, I put a title as Soil Health Management in Semi-Yield Agroecosystems. And um, thank you for organizing this event. Now, first, I would like to start, uh, you know, just a recap. I, I believe everyone knows what soil health is, but uh, we need to uh, think that uh, it indicates a continued capacity of soil to function in any given ecosystem boundary. And then this is a very familiar figure that we have you know, physical properties of soil. Uh, it's a soil has its own structure, its chemical uh, composition and biology. And when these uh, three components are in sound physical, chemical and biological condition, that can support crop production and also provide ecosystem services. You know, not only production is important, at the same time, you know, maintaining uh, water cycling, maintaining nutrient cycling, uh, for example, carbon sequestration, uh, which is the biggest reservoir of uh, carbon, you know, soil um, has the biggest reservoir of carbon. So doing all these functions while producing crop is important. And that is, that is where we talk about soil health. You know, it looks very simple, you know, maintain soil physics, maintain chemistry and maintain biology, and you get healthy soil. But if you look at this, uh, you know, I call black box or this brown box, it's more complicated. You know, this uh, maintaining physics, chemistry, uh, and biology is not that easy and simple as it is. So there are multiple processes going on. So we need to understand uh, what is the composition of microbial community? What is the physical properties? What are the major driver of changes in our soil? When we put some crop, when we do some, you know, grazing practices, other uh, land uh, management operations. So that process is really important. And then how that uh, input from our crop, our cover crop goes into the system, how it works, uh, or how that part of the resources is lost through runoff, erosion, leaching, or go into atmosphere as a gas. You know, if we have that knowledge, that will help us to better manage the entire system, entire uh, our management practice. So that is most uh, important. And this is more important, you know, I keep emphasizing that in uh, New Mexico, because we are on arid or semi-arid region, you know, this western part of the US, which is, uh, you know, hot environment, dry, and then low inherent fertility. That means we have, you know, low uh, baseline to begin with. So that is very critical when we are thinking building the soil uh, or improving soil health. Our precipitation is normally less than 20 inches. For example, in Clovis, 17 to 18 inches is typical. And uh, what happens when you have a less precipitation is a biomass production uh, is limited by uh, this precipitation or water availability for crop, cover crop production or uh, associated ecosystem services. So my research you know, you know, focuses on looking into microbial component of soil soil structure and soil carbon and nutrients. Uh, being a research, uh, researcher at NMSU Center, you know, mostly uh, what I bring today is my research experience and some of the experience working with farmers around this area. But overall, what I want to see, you know, looking into these uh, components, agronomic production, we need to optimize that, improve environmental quality, and also assure economic profitability to our growers. So for that, we look at microbial biomass, you know, community structure, soil respiration, enzyme activities, you know, bulk density, uh, soil aggregation, and also carbon sequestration, nutrient cycling, those aspects to look into different aspects of soil health in, in my uh, lab. So I don't want to go much detail on all these measurements because these are, um, um, I think we will go later a little bit about this, but I would like to go on what uh, I will be basically talking today is a cover crop study. I started in fall 2015. 
with eight different cover crop treatments. You know, I planted pea, oat, canola as a single species cover crop, you know, representing legume, grass type cover crop, and brassica cover crop. And we also did a mixture of pea and oat, pea and canola, pea, oat, canola. And then uh, I call diversity mix, you know, six species mixture of pea, oat, canola, barley, hairy paste, and forage radish. And this cover crop uh, treatments are integrated into uh, this winter wheat sorghum fallow rotation, which is a three year crop rotation. Because of the precipitation or you know, uh, water limitation, we cannot grow crop every year. So uh, winter wheat is started in the first year, October, harvested in second year, and then there is about 11 month fallow, no crop, no cover crop, bare ground. And then third year in June, we plant sorghum that grows for four to five months. And then again, another 11 month of fallow. So I thought, you know, we need to break that fallow. If we can cover that entire 11 month, that would be ideal. Even if not, then let's put some cover crop to see how that improve our soil and then helps uh, this wheat and sorghum production. So that was the goal. And we'll look at um, some of the soil health parameters. You know, here I am gonna show you some of the results of mineralizable carbon. That is very easily decomposable fraction of soil organic matter. You know, this can decompose within two years and supply nutrients. You know, some fraction, a small fraction of that can decompose within a season. So for example, you put cover crop, that, that cover crop residue starts decomposing and then first, the compound that decomposed first would be those labile soil organic matter. So we look at that as an early indicator because we cannot wait for 10 years or you know 10 to 100 years. There is another passive and slow pool soil organic matter that takes really long time to build. So, but we focused on this green triangle. If you look on this uh, figure and then look at their response. So on this figure, I am showing fallow, the first bar, and then all cover crops. And if you just look these different bars, you know, this labile uh, organic matter or mineralizable carbon is 20 to 80% increase with cover cropping per, you know, this is a fourth year, third and fourth year data. So within three to four years, we could see a very good increase in that uh, labile uh, fraction of soil organic matter. I will also look at uh, microbial component uh, here you can see this green triangle, and then I am putting uh, you know, some moving bog, which is active fraction, very active uh, organic matter component. And then these are the more regulators. You know, microbes are the regulators of all soil processes. When we look their uh, total biomass, how much microbe is there, we could see 11 to 34% more microbes with different cover crops than uh, with fallow. So that is our observation here. Again, three to four years uh, time frame. And I was also interested, you know, maybe this is a little more complicated, but what I am showing is each dot, if they are close, that means they have similar type of microbes. If those dots are far apart, that means the microbial composition is different on these, uh, you know, dots. So for example, here this red dot is fallow treatment. All the cover crops have different microbial composition. And if you look these uh, two treatments, uh, which I am uh, highlighting here, you know, this oat and six species mixer is moving far apart. And then we look like why this might be changing. And we could see among different cover crops we compared, what had the highest biomass? and six species mixer, there is a high diversity. So that means, you know, both high biomass is important. At the same time, having diversity, you know, it further aids to that uh, biomass, um, contribution from the biomass. And we also look, you now what may be the major driver there? You know, why these two treatments are going far away and then having the most uh, impact? 
And you could see you now these two bars uh, with oat and 60 species mixer that have the highest fungal component. So more fungus is, you know, more carbon storage, and then they can uh, kind of mix a network in a soil so it can support more resilient and more sustainable crop production. So fungal component is uh, really important. And then this cover cropping uh, looks uh, helping to build a fungal community. So that was our uh, another important observation. So we also did some visual observation like, uh, you know, NRCS, um, uh, like Kevin mentioned earlier, you know, we work uh, together on several projects and then I uh, was using their uh, in-field assessment protocol. And looking at those uh, protocols, we see a lot of visual indices, for example, improved ground cover, that is OBBS, because, uh, you know, fallow, there is no ground cover, then all cover crops have some ground cover. Beside that, we also see, you know, increased number of earthworms in our soil with uh, cover crop treatments. Now, some legal cover crop, I would not say there was a lot of nitrogen fixation, but I did not inoculate the legume, but still we could see some nitrogen fixation happening or those nodules happening in soil. So that was another interesting observation. And then we also look at cash crop yield uh, if that soil health is really linked to increased uh, production. So that is also our observation that uh, you know, some change is happening in soil and then that uh, there is just some linkage between uh, soil health improvement and uh, crop production. But you know, cover cropping is not uh, the only practice you know, we should think about. We should look at the system approach in when we talk about managing soil health. You know, that is uh, very um, important to consider cover cropping as a part of a system so that you know, we follow the practices that minimize soil disturbance, for example, reducing tillage, avoiding tillage when possible, or uh, you know, minimizing number or minimizing intensity, both uh, are important. And also maximizing soil cover through cover cropping, through mulching, you know, other forage production, or leaving residue when cover cropping is not possible. So those are the other practices. Then increasing diversity, you know, one is the plant diversity through planting a variety of cover crops. Another is integrating animal into the system. So that is also important. And then uh, also we are looking into, you know, maximizing continuous living root through, uh, we started some project on pasture cropping and perennial cropping. So I would just briefly give you overview of these projects. For example, this figure shows uh, you know, how no tillage and cover cropping were integrated in one of our study. We look at soil organic carbon. And you can see that conventional tilled, no cover cropping uh, practice in dry land had lowest amount of soil carbon. And then when we minimize disturbance, it increased carbon, for example, strip tillage. And then no tillage. Uh, strip tillage means cultivating in strips. And another practice, no tillage, no disturbance, further increase soil carbon. And then when we ate a cover crop with strip tillage and no tillage, there was a more increase. So that benefit is kind of additive. So you practice just no tillage, you get some benefit. You practice just cover cropping, that's also benefit. But if you combine those two practices, it's more beneficial than just practicing uh, one uh, system. And another important component is uh, livestock. You know, I think uh, I, I see uh, many of you also have livestock on your system, different forms. But if you look on the Eastern side of the state, it's integral part of our farming, either in the rangeland, uh, you know, producing forage and using uh, for stall feeding dairy cattle or winter grazing in a standing crop or a cover crop residue. You know, this is my cover crop plot, this uh, yellow flower you can see. And then on the next uh, to our research center, the farmer's field, they are, uh, they are grazing wheat stubble. So this is, uh, this is typical practice around here. So I was interested looking into how they can contribute uh, to overall building soil health. So here we look at uh, 
you know, our research farm with no tillage, strip tillage practice, uh, conventional tillage practice, but conventional tillage with a grazing. And then also look at uh, grassland, which was grazed and ungrazed, two different kinds of grasslands. And uh, there, uh, you know, we look at enzyme, beta glucosaminidase enzyme. This enzyme is related to organic matter cycling. If there is a more enzyme activity, that means there is more organic matter and then live uh, micro microbes working on those soil. So looking at that, you know, uh, on grassland, undisturbed grassland, ungrazed grassland had the highest. But even grazed grassland have uh, more than, you know, cropland systems. And in among cropland, no tillage, strip tillage, and conventional tilled, but grazed cropland, that the blue bar, in a CTGC. This one is a grazed cropland system. So that has a more beta glucosaminidase activity. That means more microbial activity happening with uh, grazing as compared to no grazed uh, cropland system. And when we look at that uh, labile carbon, which is main source of nutrients for our crop, that is also high in, that is highest in grazed grassland. And among croplands, again, CTGC, you know, typically, if we are not grazing, conventional tillage have lowest amount of mineralizable carbon. But here, we can see the mineralizable carbon is more than in a strip till system. So overall, what I am trying to say is, you know, grazing is also helping to improve uh, soil health in the system. And I also look at how compost you know, sometimes you cannot have a cattle on your property. In that case, can you bring compost or can you bring manure, you know, chicken manure, uh, cow manure, uh, or goat manure, and then use that uh, uh, for improving soil health? Then that is also, um, you know, we have also seen some uh, improvements, specifically you know, the most visual was this C0 indicates no compost addition, C3, three ton per acre, C6, six ton, nine ton, 12 ton, and 15 ton. And you can see, especially like 12 and 15 ton compost application, there is enormous amount of root. You know, same two plants planted on each uh, uh, these uh, pots. This is a small greenhouse study to look at to closely look at uh, how that works in, uh, how that improves soil health. What is the major effect? And then this was the most visual impact we could see on greenhouse. And then we also did a similar experiment in the field, like a sorghum field, no tillage sorghum field, and then canola field. And we see some positive response of composting with um, this uh, uh, in, in cover, uh, in, improving soil health. And then there we measure soil carbon with this different rate. And then there is a linear increase with increasing compost. I think this is more simple and more obvious that if you have provide more organic matter, you can measure you know, total uh, soil organic matter content is increased. So that is uh, our observation. So overall, you know, what I am uh, looking into is you know, different soil organic matter component microbes and how they work in short term. You know, most of these studies are two to three years, four years, but I'm also aiming to continue these observations in different system, looking into slow pool soil organic matter, passive soil organic matter, which is a kind of uh, uh, like a storehouse of nutrients. And then overall carbon sequestration in uh, the overall system. So what uh, we, um, you can see, you know, improving soil health is a challenge in hot, dry, semi arid environment. But uh, it is not impossible. You know, with cover cropping, we have seen some improvement in soil health. Specifically in Clovis, we have seen oats and their mixer with other cover crops were effective in improving soil health. And also reducing tillage uh, can complement cover cropping practice. So that can maximize the benefit. So minimize your uh, tillage or uh, minimize uh, the disturbance of your soil. Having livestock is a blessing, you know, it aids uh, and then sometimes it is uh, 
as effective as other conservation practices like reduced tillage, no tillage, cover cropping, you know, livestock itself is also effective. Using compost could be an option uh, where uh, livestock grazing is not possible because we have seen having cattle in the ground is more beneficial than just putting the compost. You know, they have some other spatial effects. That's uh, also our observation. And another question Christine asked, like, what is uh, next? Now, this is a very good question, also tough, but uh, as I said, uh, this is uh, only five years. Uh, you know, I, I have been working in Eastern New Mexico, so I plan to continue working on this system, continue understanding. Like I said, this is just one experiment, but we have a cover crop study in the forage system. We have dry land, we work with the farmers, you know, different cover crops. So I will continue working with the, you know, uh, producers around here. I will continue some of these experiments um, in the provided, you know, I have funding to maintain all these experiments. And then also we started, you know, looking into different uh, options, not only cover cropping, not only uh, reduced tillage, but some farmers around here, they do tillage in five to six years. They find that is beneficial. So we started a project. What happens if you leave, you know, uh, no tillage for 10, 15 years, and then another piece of land we started tilling in every six years. So uh, first sixth year, uh, we start. We did tillage last uh, winter, and then uh, I'm planning another piece every eight years. If we do that kind of occasional tillage, does that uh, help our hard soil? We are working on that project. We are also working, we started, you know, perennial wheat uh, here. So uh, I am planning to work on perennial crops, like perennial wheat, perennial sorghum. You know, we heard a perennial canola is also coming. So looking into those perennial crops, which puts more input into soil, and then how that relates to production and uh, long-term sustainability. And uh, we are also working on another project where we redesigned, you know, center pivot irrigation system with putting some buffer, grass buffer strips, native grasses with um, annual cropping so that we can maximize ecosystem services. For example, those native grasses, you know, attract uh, pollinators and then also helps in soil. So we just started those projects. So I will continue this practice and then maybe continue working with uh, you guys wherever, whenever possible. So that is uh, with that, you know, I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators, you know, funding agency and, uh, you know, project uh, partners and also collaborating producers who contributed in these projects. So thank you, Rajan. This That was really great. I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I was just curious as you were talking about, you know, um, what you saw with an increase in fungal communities um especially within the oats and the i think it was six species mix um i was you know well um having um you know being in a uh, arid environment um thinking about the difficulties of um uh having fungal communities thrive in in the desert um or or maybe not i was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you see specific to um, New Mexico um, with respect to fungal communities? Yeah, you know, like I said, uh, uh, both fungal and other microbial community, it is, uh, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, it is not as easy as, you know, some other regions, uh, but, uh, you know, if you follow those uh, soil health practices like, uh, you know, some cover cropping, and especially for fungal growth, uh, it is important to have, uh, you know, less disturbance. So that is the key. You know, our the cover crop plots, uh, all these cover crop plots, I follow with no tillage and cover cropping together. So it's a kind of combined effect of no till plus cover cropping, because uh, you know, if you do tillage, uh, although you put uh, cover crop, you know, cover crops helps uh, their growth, but when you do tillage, that destroys those uh, fungal network. 
So that is uh, very critical. You know, you maintain uh, no tillage or minimize the traffic. That is uh, important for uh, increasing fungal uh, component. All right, good. Thanks, Amy. Kevin, go ahead and, and take it away. <clears throat> you see it now? Yeah. It's very okay. Good. It changes stuff on my end. So uh, this is part of a presentation that I did at the organic conference, and I was talking about cover crops and them being just one part of the uh, road to recovery. And it was, it was part of a bigger concept, which was that uh, right now agriculture is looking for a recovery, and there's a there's a large movement right now, and it's a much needed movement that uh, has moved towards regenerative agriculture and uh, more holistic methods and uh, and a lot of this that, that Rajan has just talked about and uh, he's measuring and looking at and, you know, more people are using these things. So um, this was part of that presentation and it, uh, Rajan did a good job of summarizing this up and, and uh, I uh, just want to kind of we talk about the weather extremes and uh, New Mexico definitely has its share of weather extremes and always has. So this isn't something new for us like it is for many other parts of the country that are, that are seeing significant rainfall events and long periods of uh, drought. We're used to that. We're used to the hot temperatures, the droughts. So I think in a way we're better prepared than many places for these weather extremes. But um, this kind of summarizes the, uh, the soil health concepts in a little different way, but you got to protect that soil surface. Um, and I listed there to the side then some different management practices that we can put in place to do those, but you'll notice that cover crops plays a part in every single one of these as I talk about them. And it's by no means a silver bullet, but it definitely has a common theme of cover crops being able to do multiple things if done properly. They also can create the opposite of what we want if not done properly. Um, you can overseed a cover crop and actually drought it out and then create a bare surface that you wouldn't have had, you know, if you hadn't have decided to plant a cover crop and, and then overseeded it. So uh, doing it properly and, and knowing the management behind it is key when, when trying to do cover crops. Um, we can use them, of course, to increase, increase the organic matter in our soils. And that's something that we have done well with our, uh, our grains and our, our uh, small grains crops, you know, our wheats, oats. We can do that all day long. Everybody knows how to put wheat in the ground, get it to grow. It covers over the fall or they put oats in the spring and, you know, so we can We've got that figured out. We know how to increase our organic matter if we reduce that tillage and, and keep our cover crops in the soil. Where we, we need to focus more of our attention and, and maybe twist our goals a little bit is, is the next bullet point to increase our micro, microbiology in our soils. Our soils are microbiology deficient. Uh, we have a, not only a lack of number, but a lack of diversity. A lot of that's directly related to the lack of moisture, of course. So when we do our cover cropping, we need to think about putting species in the mix that aren't in the soil the remainder part of the year, whether it be through our cropping, our other cover crops, our vegetable gardens. We want to focus on those plant species that are going to feed a part of the microbiological system that we have suppressed through our our conventional systems. And then last, of course, decreasing the disturbance to the naturally occurring biological system. Um, you know, so I, I go there to say, if we're putting chemical fertilizers out, we're disrupting that system. If we're tilling, we're disrupting that system. We can do tillage with cover crops. We can do, uh, provide nutrients with cover crops if we do them right. Um, so those are more advanced ways we can use cover crops, but that's where we're headed and, and that's where I work with people to figure out exactly, you know, what is your goal and, and what are we trying to manage besides just the increasing of organic matter in our soils. So these are what I call the, uh, the four R's of cover cropping and um, I told everyone forever there was the four R's of nutrient management, you know, and they were 
how do we chemically fix the soil, right? So I've created my own four hours of cover cropping and it's how do we naturally fix the soil. And when you're cover cropping, the first thing you got to think about is you have to have the right plants for our environment. And there's certain plants that are adapted and tailored to our environment and work well as cover crops. And there are some species that honestly don't waste your, your money because they're not worth what you spend on them. They just don't work and they're not a good fit for our environment and our harsh arid conditions. Um, you gotta have the right mix for the job. And so when I, when I help producers put mixes together, we're accomplishing a task. We have a job for that cover crop and we have a plan for that cover crop because that job is accomplished in X amount of time. So we wanna make sure that we have a termination plan for that cover crop. And we know what our end height is or our end date is or our end water use is for that cover crop. And we stick to that and we terminate that cover crop according to that plan. If you don't, it doesn't do the job you intended for it to do. It usually ends up doing some harm along with the good. The right number of plants is key. Um, this is what has caused so many people to say, I tried cover crops and they didn't work because they either overseeded or underseeded and didn't have the right rate when planting their cover crops. So uh, we've done a lot of work and have some good you know, ideas you know, through the research and other things we've done as to what that right starting point is for a uh, number of plants. And that's, that's number of plants per area or number of plants per acre. Um, some plants occupy a bigger space, some a smaller space. So we have to think about that. And then the right time in the rotation. And, and Rajan was showing us a little diagram with the rotation earlier. And you got to have those at the right time in that rotation where you can get them in, out, and still do what you need to for the, uh, for the, perp the other purposes of your, your cash crops or your other crops that you're doing. Um, so you got to have them in at the right time. And then I just have a last bullet point. There's utilize the technologies available to make the best of it. There are a ton of technologies that work very well uh, along with cover crops and, and they actually create a, a synergism that uh, sometimes we can't even explain. But by, by using these other technologies, these other products, um, we can actually even get more bang for our buck. When, uh, when using cover crops. So um, when, I, when I work with producers and, and we have, you know, obviously some very harsh conditions here in New Mexico, um, we always start with, with what we do know. And uh, that's, you know, we use a diverse mixture. I hardly ever recommend someone use one or two species. Um, four or five is kind of that sweet spot to start with. And then as people understand and learn more, uh, we just keep adding more and more species to that. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of people tell me you can get too many species. I don't think you can get too many species, but I think you can get the seeding rate too high by adding too many species at the recommended rate. Um, so if, if we know what we're doing and we reduce those rates, we can make a 16, 18 species cover crop mix work. We just don't do it at the recommended rate that most of the seed companies are gonna tell you you need to plant it at because then you do have too much and it, it just ends up being a headache and a problem. Um, we know we have to reduce this disturbance along with the cover crops. That's one of those synergistic effects that if you no-till and cover crop, just like Rajan showed earlier, you really get a lot of mileage out of your cover crops. And then we, I work with people a lot on utilizing our weather extremes and our moistures to our benefit. Uh, I do a lot of seeding. Well, on a typical year, we would have been seeding the last couple months and utilizing this monsoon season. Um, I hope you guys have had more rain than me because I finally measured my first measurable rain last Thursday since March. So uh, not a good year for me to try and utilize the monsoon season because it wouldn't have done any good. And then also winter moisture. When do we get our snows? When can we have that seed in the ground and use that winter moisture to provide some ground cover and get that biology to, to wake up and start, start uh, 
doing what it needs to do. So I work with people a lot on utilizing when we get our moisture, learning our, our moisture patterns, and when you can depend on moisture in our environment. So we're, we're working more on, you know, learning how to jumpstart our microbiology and how to feed them, and then how to alter our microbiology to enhance our crops. And uh, that's where I've started focusing my attention more. Uh, the basics we've got down, but then helping you to figure out, like was mentioned, you know, Amy asked about the fungal, um, really tailoring those cover crops and increasing those fungal populations. We know enough now that we can develop a mix with species that will target your mycorrhizal fungi and help them come on, uh, especially if you're in an orchard vineyard situation where you really need them to help feed the nutrients to the plant. We know which species can help do that. We know the soils tests that are out there that can test which ones you're lacking, what you have, what their actual DNA is, and then what, what species of plants do we use to feed and really tune in on, on boosting your mycorrhizal fungi versus your bacteria, for example. Um, so that's, that's where I've started taking this and, and working with people on their soil health tests and uh, getting those PFLA tests and knowing what the, the phospholipid fatty acids say about the general groups or even more specific tests if uh, people are interested. So I just wanted to, you know, I, I think we have people that have, have used cover crops, maybe people that haven't as much, people just starting. Um, so I've got these three general rules that I like to, to, to put out there when people are starting. First of all, keep the planting rates down. Don't put a bunch out, see what a little does first, and then bump it from there the next time. But uh, the, the, the worst thing you can do is overseed a cover crop and create a problem for yourself in your next cash crop or your net, you know, next seeding, um, even droughting out, you know, what you thought would be a uh, pasture to feed animals and planting it too heavy and not getting the growth or the biomass and not having the feed that you want. And then I already mentioned earlier, but keep it to four to five species to start with. That's a good starting point. I personally like to make sure there's a legume in every uh, mix that I do. So uh, I won't have a, a mix that I start with that's just four grasses. You know, I'll have a brassica or a legume uh, both in there along with a couple grasses. And then make sure your legume is inoculated every time. You're not gonna get any nitrogen fixation or minimal nitrogen fixation if that seed has not been inoculated with the right, uh, the right inoculant to uh, fix nitrogen. You need the right strain of rhizobium with that particular seed. That way you get the benefits for uh, nitrogen fixation. So uh, something else that comes up a lot is when should I plant them? Um, one question I get a lot is, well, how, how much time do I need? Uh, how long you know, do I have to let a cover crop go before I get some benefit? And we've seen that you need that 68 week window at a minimum. If you only have four weeks, it may not you know, be worth your investment to put that cover crop out because you likely won't get the job done that you want the cover crop to do. Um, in the summer, six weeks probably more likely. Your winter, your cool season crops, you probably need at least eight weeks to, for them to at least perform a part of the job that you expect them to do. Um, plant them when there's moisture or you can use the least amount of irrigation. Um, I like to point out the least amount of irrigation because we know water's precious here in New Mexico. And you know, whether it, you get your water through a ditch or you have to pump it, there's a cost associated with that water. So I like to, you know, September, October is a good time when we're getting some additional rainfall. We can use a little less irrigation to get those cover crops to perform that same job. And so I, I like to put a plug in there that we want to do it. Uh, not necessarily in the middle of June and July when our evapotranspiration rates, rates are out of this world because you're putting more water on to get anything done. Um, make sure your species aren't going to impact the next crop in the rotation negatively. Also, a rule that I have with that is, for example, 
Don't put spring wheat out in a summer cover crop when you're going to fall wheat as your cash crop uh, because you continue that pest cycle. Those plants occupy the same niche, the same spot, the same nutrients, and you end up just creating a problem for yourself. So when doing a cover crop mix, I never put in the mix this, any of the species that are gonna be followed by it. Even if it's two cover crop mixes back to back, I make sure that I don't have the same thing in there twice. So I don't create any problems in a pest cycle that, that we don't want. Um, and then, you know, and that's because you have that continuous host uh, and you just continue that life cycle and that life cycle is meant to be broken. So it's just a good management technique to make sure and not have those in that, that cash crop. So I didn't necessarily go into which species work or what we're doing this time of year. Um, and we can, you know, talk about that just for a second, but <clears throat> I have several mixes that I use and, you know, one of them's a cool season soil builder mix that we use this time of year coming off of vegetables that we, uh, you know, that's, that's a good one that has some diversity. Um, I kind of just open it up, I guess, and see what everybody's kind of situation is and what you're thinking. And if there's some specific questions for particular species and how they perform or don't perform. Um, I know John called me this afternoon. He's given a presentation tomorrow and he said, okay, Kevin, give me the, the quick and dirty over what's working and what's not working uh, this time of year. I'll tell you that I prefer not to use just wheat, just rye, or just triticale going into my, my winter cover crop. I always say use at least two, but don't ever bank on just one of those uh, small grains in your, your fall seeded, you know, overwintering cover crop. Use two because it, you got to understand that moisture and temperature needs for those different plant species are different. And so it's kind of like being an opportunistic. So, you know, wheat may not hit, but triticale will, or barley may hit and rye does it. So I always have two uh, small grains, whether it be in that spring or that fall seeded. Um, Austrian winter peas is one of my favorites going in this time of year to put with those. I've grown pretty fond of the forage collards because I've seen a lot of great things out of them as far as what they do with that yellow bloom and uh, so just some different things. I've seen some synergism with them in the mix that I can't really explain, but really cool new cover crop that we've seen a lot of good success. Um, and you can plant it spring or fall. It, it, it seems to work either way. Uh, whenever you throw it out, it, it seems to work. Um, just trying to think. I'll open it up for questions and we can kind of tackle, I guess, the, the specifics, Jeff, if people have them, but that's kind of a, an overview of some of the things that are working. What cover crops do you not recommend or do poorly here in New Mexico? Hmm. Well, I already told you that earlier. I'm not a fan of hairy vetch it, and I know a lot of people use it. But hairy vetch gets to be a weed, and I've had just as many people call and yell at me for hairy vetch as I have had people bless me for hairy vetch. So um, I think common vetch gets the same job done without becoming the problem of a weed, personally. And so we've had a lot more success using common vetch than hairy vetch. If you're okay with it completely taking over and you want to mow it and trip through it and, you know, okay go ahead and plant it if you're in a perennial situation. But if you're in a, a row crop, crop, vegetable type situation, not under you know an orchard or a vineyard, it seems to cause a problem more than, than not. And you may not see it year one or year two, but at some point we're gonna get the perfect rainfall at the perfect soil temperature. And you're gonna get this crazy flush of hairy vetch that overtakes everything in the area. Um, so that's one that I would say, you know, use with caution for sure. Well, John, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I also agree on that. You know, if you have extreme dry situation, I don't think it uh, biomass production also okay. very good. 
if you have more moisture, then it would create another problem. So I, I agree on that aspect. Very good. Um, you know, then... what to use, um, like uh, on, on the other side, uh, my experience is for more biomass, you, you need a grass type uh, cover crops like, uh, you know, oat, winter kill situation, oat is perfect. You plant early, it's get winter kill. You know, barley also works good. And if you want to keep it for a spring, you know, maybe uh, annual rye grass uh, or winter rye. But again, I think that is also uh, here in Clovis, we have seen if you keep it too long, even after you spray, it regrows a little bit. So there is a chance, you know, if you, if you keep it too long, that could be a problem. But biomass wise, that is also good. Critically, it does good. And, but I also, uh, you know, I personally, if you are spending too much money uh, in different species, I don't like that, but we have seen, you know, pea and oat mixer yeah, here, or 60 species mixer. So anywhere between two to five, six species, I see that is uh, economical and also, uh, you know, good for your uh, uh, crop or good for your soil. So that is uh, my observation and that is my suggestion. If I someone asks like how many species, what, you know, at least puts two or three species that gives you uh, different groups, different rooting habit, different moisture uh, extraction pattern. Uh, but, uh, you know, too many species, if it is cheap, uh, that is, that may help. But if you are spending too much money, I, I would not recommend uh, that uh, uh, to going into like 18 species, you know, 20 species, possibly six or seven species does the same thing as, uh, you know, 12 or 18 species. That's my uh, experience. I get a lot of my seed from green cover, just so everybody knows. I'm a... I'm a distributor for them and I think they have some of the best seed out there and they have some of the best uh, diversity. So I can speak to the smart mix calculator very well. And no, Isabel, it does not take into consideration the limitations and the seeding rates. And so that's what I spend a lot of time doing is, you know, a lot of times someone will have gone to that seed calculator, ordered the mix, got it, it didn't work. And then they call me and then I help them through that. And, and we, we back those mixes off, we, pick, we back off the uh, seeding rate. So um, that's, that's where trial and error and, and the expertise and the uh, doing cover crops for about the last 12 years in New Mexico is a lot of times I just know a rate that works, you know, for, for a particular species. And so I know what our limit is on the top end, you know, of, of seeding rate for an overall mixture as well as each particular species, what their limit is for a seeding rate. When too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. So don't trust, I mean, a seed calculator is there, but don't trust it. You gotta, I always take that automatic off and start reducing rates. That's the first thing I do. And also it, you buy less seed, it's cheaper, right? You get the same job done for, you know, a portion of the dollars. Um, not to badmouth seed dealers in any way, but they'll sell you as much seed as you want to buy every time. And uh, I've been chased out of the room before, but I'm going to continue to say it. You don't have to buy, you know, 100 pounds of wheat per acre. Don't need it, never will, but they'll sell it to you every time you walk into a, a, a seed distributor. So... Do you have like a, a ballpark um, reduction that you apply? No, it's uh, it's one of those. It just depends on every mix. Um, I took out the slide and and I can email it to uh, you guys, so you can have my slide that kind of says the 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 work through, if you're dry land, and then if this, then your 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 overall plant population per acre needs to equal somewhere around you know this, and uh, it's like two hundred you know. You're in a really limited dry land situation. You need to look at about 250,000 plant population per acre, and then you you know there's different variables in there. But uh, people look at that and go, "That's hardly any seed." Exactly, 
if you're in an extremely dry land situation, that's all you need. That's all your ecosystem can support. And uh, I've spent a lot of time studying natural rangeland ecosystems in New Mexico and what number of plants they can support per acre. And so from that, I've worked backwards into a cover crop system that then mimics what the natural system could actually, through its soil type, available soil moisture, and plant types, actually support, and then figure out from there, then, you know, plant populations. John, do you want to I think that? that is an uh, excellent point, uh, Kevin Benson. You know, we need to look into plant population, how much it can support. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you know, it might be uh, like, again, the seed industry, people might not be happy. In a dry land situation, I go about 50% of the typical seeding rate. That is what I have been telling. And then looking into different species, you know, some species uh, germinate well. And then your seeding depth, you know, uh, in mixer, uh, that seeding depth favors some species. And then, you know, for some other species, it is not ideal. Uh, so we need to work uh, specific to your system. But if you have more leverage in water, if you can, you know, put more water, then go 70, 60, 70, you know, increase seeding rate. But if you have, uh, if you are real limited, then I would go around 50% of a typical seeding rate. So that is my, uh, you know, general rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just remember that all plants have a different number of plants per pound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're doing legumes and you got a bunch of clovers in there, you could easily have 3 million plants per acre really quick with clover seed in just a few pounds. And so that's why I talk about plants per acre, you know, more than seed rate. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your, your acre is only going to support a half million plants. Well, clover, you know, some of those are two and a half million seeds per pound. Yeah. So if you, if you go out and put the normal eight pound rate, you just threw 16 million seeds on an acre that can only support a plant population of 500,000. And that's where I talk about, we spend a lot of money on seed we, that never will germinate or make it a lot of the times. You were saying to include uh, like different, uh, like cereals, like two, at least two cereals in a mix. Uh, how, or how would you do that it with planning to use a roller crimper? Uh, since those tend to have different maturities. Um, so that is a, you know, a, a good point is that, you know, you may have to crimp twice sometimes in that particular situation if one does mature, but there are different varieties where you can match that up fairly close and usually, you know, get them with one crimp and get them in that dose stage, you know, and where they break off and crimp. And so it's kind of a variety specific thing. Um, just knowing that, you know, some er earlier maturing, later maturing, and uh, you can you can match up that maturity, you know, pretty close to where within a week's window, you could, you could probably roll it and be all right, not have it come back and get, you know, probably get a 95% kill. You, you're gonna lose a little bit if you put two in there, but you still, you can get close. As to, uh, so that's kind of one of the reasons that we're gonna to do uh, that cover crop trial uh, is to try and find some of those different varieties because it seems like that is really uh, like regionally specific uh, down to like microclimates and and year to year also is going to fluctuate a little bit. Uh, so I, I guess that just kind of aligns with what I was thinking, but so so I'm not sure where to quite figure out for those different varieties and when exactly they're going to what's going to line up for here. Yeah, and uh, you'll see it in a field too. Different soil types will will get you too. Um, you know, and it's it's back to moisture availability, and you'll get some part of the field that's got more moisture available, so that plant's more mature and ahead than you know the the tight clay that doesn't give it up. And so even within a field, you'll see differences, unfortunately. And you'll have some that's ready, you know, a week before the other part of the field. And it's due to water availability. 
Would you expect that to go down over time as soils improve? As you get your organic matters up, definitely. Yeah, you, that, that disappears. But when you're starting and you have sand and you have clay, you know, or a good loam and a, a sandy spot, you, you see a, a big difference, but they do come together over time as organic matters come up. For planting the fall cover crop, for those areas that get early frost, is there still enough time for them to plant or are you looking at first frost or are you looking at snow heavy frost? What is that six week window of establishment you're looking at? So I'm usually talking about that frost that kills them, John, you know, so most of them cool seasons can tolerate that, that first initial, you know, we get that frost that then it warms up for three weeks. They can usually, you know, you might see a little bit of freeze damage. They can generally tolerate that one or two night, get down. So I'm talking about, you know, once we get to a week of freezing temperatures time, you know, so in your area, that's probably towards the end of October before you really get to, you know, maybe even first 10 days in November for you, depending on which zone and area you're at. Um, yeah. So if you got six weeks before that, you're okay. Yeah, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, and I have people from Raton, from Springer, from Silver, from Out by You, from Navajo Land, and so I know that question will come up. So I just want to articulate if it's a cool season, if it's light frost versus heavy frost. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah, yeah. Once you get three or four nights, and, and if they're too young, you're done. They're going to freeze yeah, off. Below 20. Below 20. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. And did you say collard, uh, field collards? Forage collards. Forage collards. And is that different than rapeseed or rubs, or, or is that the same thing or different thing? Oh, it's a different one. And okay. it's, it's bred specifically to provide forage for cattle. And so okay. it's, it's a grazing variety of, uh, of collard. And it, honestly, I've seen it do some things that rapeseed and the other collards, it adapts well to our environment. It's definitely one of those that I put it in about every mix now. Thank you for that. And my last question is in regards to soil disturbance. With raised beds, I'm telling people that let them dry out to turn it over before planting cover crop because there's no moisture. But if there is cover crop, what is the level of disturbance needed to raise vegetables afterwards? Because sometimes vegetables can be smothered by the cover crop. So where is that balancing act in between? So you're asking where's the balancing act on killing the cover crop and getting the vegetables started? Correct. And how much disturbance is needed for the vegetable crop to come in um, if the cover crop is there? Because I know they need some room to grow. Um, so just curious how much disturbance is needed to get enough room for the vegetables to grow. Um, so I'll tell you, I failed two years ago and my cover crops outdid my vegetables in one of my raised beds. So um, <laughs> it's a trial and error thing. Um, it really depends on what you have in there. But I'll tell you right now, if you have something like wheat, it will keep coming and keep coming. I honestly thought I could just keep trimming it back and exhaust it. No, never did. So, uh, you know, if you have the small grains, unfortunately, you got to kind of disturb that a little bit to get them, get them out of there. So your tomatoes, chilies, you know, some of those just don't tolerate a cover crop underneath them to get started. Now they'll tolerate it once, so once they get taller. Um, but if you had a, a cover crop with all clover and it wasn't very tall, you could just make a strip, put your vegetables in there, you'd be all right. So it really just kind of depends on what species you have in there to answer, you know, that question as to how much disturbance you need. And I always recommend two weeks before planting to uh, mow it down or kill the crop. Is that do we need longer or is it really species dependent on the cover crops for termination? It is species dependent and uh, just think those nutrients aren't going to be available in two weeks either. 
So if you're depending on those nutrients to be available for those starts, you probably need to be closer to four to six weeks ahead of transplanting your vegetables in there to begin to get some of those nutrients available. Yeah, I think at least um, two to three weeks is uh, needed. And depending on moisture and then what species you have, I can add here uh, maybe one uh, you know, trial we did, how fast uh, that uh, brassica or canola decompose, how fast pea and then oat, you know, we look at that uh, decomposition study uh, here in Clovis. And uh, we see if you have more brassica, that decompose faster, sometimes even faster than pea or uh, hairy beds. So uh, that can uh, release nutrients uh, very soon, you know, within a month or within a couple months. And then a pea uh, is uh, second. And oat, barley, you know, those uh, grass type cover cups takes longer, five to okay. six months. So that is also important when you select a species. You know, maybe uh, if you need more fast decomposition, increase number of uh, brassica and legume. Then if you are looking into more longer term, year round, kind of then add more uh, grass type uh, cover crop in the mixer. So that, uh, you know, we need to, it's uh, like uh, trial and error learning by uh, doing, uh, but uh, that is uh, one important thing to look uh, when you terminate and then what to plant next. Thank you both.